This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's your new profession or just a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their amazing all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. One hundred fifty years ago, an upheaval took place that shook France to its core. Following a disastrous military defeat, decades of bottled-up anger exploded on Paris's streets. The government, the police, and military all fled in the face of this insurrection, abandoning the capital to the lower classes. In their place rose one of the most radical, most divisive, and shortest-lived political entities in Western European history: the Paris Commune. A hyper-egalitarian, anarchist, and heavily autonomous state, the Commune ran the City of Lights for a little over two months before being brutally. Put Put down. In that short time, it sowed the seeds of countless later movements. Marx and Lenin were inspired by the Commune, as was Chairman Mao. Closer to their own time, France's Gilets Jaunes protesters frequently referenced the events of 1871. Yet the legacy of the Commune is more complicated than simple radicalism. At a time of inequality, it championed things like women's rights and universal education. Yet its progress was also marked by hostage-taking, violence, and the near destruction of Paris itself. If they were handing out awards for craziest eight decades in French history, the gold medal winner every time would be the 82 years separating 1789 and 1871. In that time, the space of one longish life, France saw revolutions depose kings, empires replace revolutionaries, kings restored, empires restored, and uncountable years of warfare. And neatly bookending it all were two political entities based in Paris. Two radical bodies that shared a name, separated, by a near century. That name was the Paris Commune. Established at the dawn of the French Revolution in the wake of the storming of the Bastille, the original Commune was an attempt by Parisians to run Paris for themselves. Effectively a sovereign entity, it was born from decades of frustrations, frustrations that came boiling over in the fires of revolution. It was radical, connected to its community in a way Paris's leaders had never been before, but it was also violence, intimately linked to Maximilien Robespierre and his reign of terror. Long after it was dismantled, both these images of the Commune lingered in the French psyche. You Utopia or dystopia, depending on which side of the guillotine you happen to be standing. It would be these dueling visions of history that influenced its 1871 rebirth. Okay, now we need to fast forward a little here, all the way across the various empires, republics, and revolutions of the 19th century, all the way to 1870. As the year dawned, France was officially the second French empire under Napoleon III, the mustachioed nephew of OG Napoleon. Now approaching its 18th anniversary, the empire seemed strong, stable, eternal even. But that was just on the surface. Scratch the veneer of Napoleon III's autocratic paradise and you'd find currents of swirling discontent. Individual eddies of frustration that were something to pull them together could create a maelstrom of revolution. Sadly for the emperor, that something was already on the horizon. While the Second French Empire was skipping gaily into its 18th year, a new European power was on the verge of being born. Over in Prussia, Otto von Bismarck was preparing to place the final cherry atop his cake of nation building. Over the previous six years, the Iron Chancellor had bulldozed his army across Central Europe, fighting wars to slowly unite the 39 German states under Prussia's control. Now Bismarck calculated he needed just one more big war to finish the job, one big war to bring the holdout states into his united Germany. And what better way to fight than with Berlin's historical enemy, France. That July 1870 Bismarck engineered a diplomatic incident so insulting to French honor that Napoleon III immediately declared war. To which Bismarck was all like, meh, sucker, before absolutely going to town on the empire. The Franco-Prussian War was as one-sided as watching a professional YouTuber step into a cage with a pissed off version of Conor McGregor that's also armed with cannons. The Prussians tore through France. In early September, Napoleon III himself was taken prisoner. So enraged were regular folks that they deposed the absent emperor in a bloodless revolution. But rather than stop fighting now that their enemy was in turmoil, the Prussians drove ever deeper into France. In mid-September, they surrounded the capital. It was the beginning of the Siege of Paris, a grueling three-month blockade that cut off the city from the outside world, killed 50,000 people, and forced the starving citizens to live off rats. But its bitter ends would also be the trigger for something far more radical. It was from this miserable siege that the second Paris Commune would soon be born.
For late 19th century dudes, the Siege of Paris was one of the defining events. Not until World War II would another major European city be so completely surrounded, cut off, and isolated. As the rest of France crumbled, the citizens of Paris were locked in and bombarded, a constant rain of artillery shells. But the worst didn't come from the Prussian army, well, not directly. No, the real nightmares were the weather and the hunger. As fall gave way to cold and bitter winter, conditions became intolerable. The city's horses were slaughtered for food. When they were gone, people turned to eating rats. It was a hellish existence. Three months of starvation, disease, and deprivation. One in which up to 50,000 people died. But it was also a hell that would make Parisians more defiant than ever. Inside the French capital, people were weary and exhausted, yes, but they were also combative. The way they saw it, they were the ones on the front lines, defending French honor against Prussia's war machine. This wasn't an atmosphere of despair. It was one of patriotism. The patriotism of the Blitz spirit, or the sort that gripped NYC after 9-11. Parisians were hurting, but so long as they knew it was for something to defeat a common enemy, it would all be worth it. Unfortunately, defeating a common enemy was exactly what wasn't going to happen. From a practical perspective, a French surrender was inevitable. There's simply no way to turn the tide in a war that had gone this badly wrong. Better to just cut their losses and negotiate with Bismarck. On February the 8th, elections for the post-Empire National Assembly seemed to prove this, returning a massive majority of anti-war conservatives. At their head was Adolphe Thiers, who'd once served as Prime Minister under France's final king. In early 1871, though, Thiers' one concern was getting the Prussian army off French soil no matter what the cost. And you'd better believe that cost was going to be astronomical. Bismarck demanded a 5 billion franc indemnity, equivalent to nearly a quarter of French GDP, and the surrender of Alsace and Lorraine. He also insisted Prussian troops be allowed to hold a victory parade in Paris, the same city that just spent three months bombing into oblivion. Although a few left-wing deputies in the new assembly, including the novelist Victor Hugo, protested, Thiers' only reaction to Bismarck's humiliating demands was a whispered oui. When news hit Paris of the surrender terms, it did so with the force of 10,000 Prussian artillery shells. After suffering insane deprivation and trauma for their country, Prisians were now being told by their same country, Yeah, I mean, sorry, but it was all kind of a nothing. Ah, c'est la vie. It was like Adolphe Thiers and his entire government had personally lined up to kick every single Parisian in the testicles. In the siege-shattered city, rumors flew that had sold them out. Meanwhile, below the surface in the capital's collective psyche, those currents of discontent began to swirl together to join into a black, rolling sea of anger. In the working-class districts, weapons were stockpiled. People talked of attacking the Prussians during their victory parade, of restoring the city's honor. In the end, though, it would only be after the Prussians were gone that Paris finally ignited. On March the 3rd, after two days of parades and celebrations, the 30,000 Prussian troops Thiers had let into Paris marched away. By now, tensions were at boiling point. It would take an incredibly empathetic leader to stop it all spilling over into violence. Sadly, Adolf Thiers had all the emotional intelligence of a half-eaten banana. Rather than stop Paris from exploding, he would soon be the one to push the detonator. In the two days of Prussian victory celebrations, the one French fighting force still allowed under arms had been the National Guard. The defenders of Paris during the siege, the Guard had started out as a middle-class institution before acquiring more and more workers. By 1871, it could call on about 400,000 men, all of whom the Prussians let keep their guns as a way of maintaining order. But if the Guard stopped angry Parisians from attacking the Prussians, it wasn't for the sake of order. It was because plenty of its more radical leaders were already preparing for a much bigger fight. One against their own government. Like everyone else in Paris, the guardsmen had been outraged at Thiers' sucky peace deal. In protest, on February the 24th, they declared themselves an independent federation under the control of a central committee. Rather than take orders from the government, guardsmen swore only to obey the committee. If Thiers gave them an order the committee was fine with, they'd go along with it. But try and pull any more of that surrender monkey crap, and these 400,000 disenchanted Parisians would fight to remove him from power. Over the next couple of weeks, the guard increased its grip over Paris, forming alliances with dozens of neighborhood watch groups known as vigilance committees. By mid-March, the guard was nothing less than an open challenge to the government's shaky authority, right in the heart of the French capital. So Thiers responded 
by moving the capital. On March the 10th, the government decamped to Versailles, a calculated snub to the Parisians. Then Thiers fired off two laws designed to cripple the National Guard, one cancelling its soldiers' salaries, and another ending a wartime moratorium on debt collection. The result was half a million already pissed off soldiers suddenly being told that not only would their defense of Paris now go unpaid, but they'd probably also be hauled off to debtors' prison. You know that saying, an eye for an eye makes the whole world go blind? Well, what's happening here is Thiers and the guard are taking it in turns to jab out as many eyes as possible, each poking the other, then being poked back until Paris is basically Nick Cage and the Wicked Man screaming, Paris! Charitably, you could say Thiers was asserting his right as elected head of government to not have a renegade army in Paris threatening a coup. Uncharitably, you could say that he was turning a potential Three Mile Island into Chernobyl. The meltdown came on March the 18th. The night before, Thiers decided to finally assert his dominance by ordering the regular army to sneak into Paris before dawn and seize the guard's stockpile of cannons. It was a hell of a reckless move. The cannons Thiers was after weren't just any old weapons. During the siege, they'd become symbols of all who'd fought and died to protect Paris. To give a rough analogy, this was like the US president ordering soldiers to seize the Liberty Bell while wiping their asses on a bald eagle made of American flags. It was insanely provocative. And it was also really badly planned. Before dawn on March the 18th, 1871, regular army soldiers located and secured the guards' guns. Then they realized that no one had brought horses to drag away the heavy cannons. They were still standing around, scratching their heads like dum-dums when Paris woke up and realized what was going on. Angry mobs formed around the soldiers, demanding they release the guns. Even now, the city might have stepped back from the brink, had it not been for Claude Lecomte. One of the generals sent to secure the cannons, Lecomte got spooked by the mob and yelled at his men to open fire. The men took one look at the poche on a horse, another at the bloodthirsty mob, and said, You know what? You guys can have him. The lynching and execution of Lecomte was the moment all hopes this could end peacefully were dashed. Realizing this was an act of war, the guards' central committee had no choice but to go all in. That morning, guardsmen seized key locations across Paris. As arms, caches, and government buildings fell, the regular army sounded a full retreat, abandoning the city. For the first time since 1795, Paris was back in the hands of the Parisians. It was the Paris Commune, Mark II, a return to the revolutionary year one. And this time around, things were going to be crazier and bloodier than ever before. And just before we continue today's video and get into all of that craziness, let me tell you about today's fantastic sponsor, Squarespace. Now more than ever, people are getting creative with their time, reaching deep into their savings accounts to start a new crafts business or any sort of business, really, or launch a blog and share their opinions with their neighbors. With Squarespace, the world is yours. It's the perfect web tool to help you fashion the internet into whatever you want it to be. It's the platform to use when you're ready to get started on that new web project you've been thinking about. You're looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like well bam use one of their quick beautiful templates to make a website that's fresh and for you or maybe you're more of a hands-on person you got lots of ideas and opinions about what exactly your site should look like well squarespace gives you all the customization options you could ever want with no updates no patches no technical nonsense to worry about and once you're done setting up your website tinkering with the design if you are so inclined or maybe just playing with the colors there are tons of extra features that squarespace provides that your website can thrive email campaigns patronage portals social integrations member only areas analytics commercial options 24 7 customer support everything you need is in one place so when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours big or small if it involves a website it's gotta be with squarespace right now you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics to save 10 percent of your first purchase of a website or a domain there's a link below and let's go back to paris Although it would end up ruling for two months, the fate of the Paris Commune was effectively sealed on March the 19th. Even as the National Guard was securing control of the last few districts, the Central Committee voted to focus on holding the city rather than overthrowing Adolphe Thiers. At the time, it sort of made sense. The Communards, as they would come to be known, didn't want to spark a civil war. They probably thought Thiers would reluctantly negotiate. They had encountered Aunt Thiers being an intransient, bloodthirsty d 
head, but they would learn soon enough. For now, the newly created commune focused on making itself seem legitimate. On March the 26th, an election was held under universal suffrage to determine the commune's future. The result was a landslide for the radicals. While there would be some small business owners and middle-class members, most of the commune's leadership was made up of an unstable collection of working-class anarchists, extreme republicans, and neo-Jacobians. For its entire existence, there would be a continuous struggle between these factions, with one side wanting to turn Paris into a utopia of decentralized, voluntary, collectivist living, and the other just itching to dig up Robespierre, wheel out the guillotine, and party like it was 1793. Still, the continuous behind-the-scenes power struggle didn't stop the commune from bringing in a host of new laws. Laws so radical they'd still be considered progressive today. At a time when most of Europe considered women to be all-purpose cleaning and baby-making machines, the commune was avowedly feminist. Not only could women vote in elections, they held important positions on committees. The famous anarchist Louise Michel, for example, was instrumental in organizing healthcare. In other ways, too, the commune was ahead of its time. Free daycare centers were open for workers, education was made free and compulsory, separation of church and state was enforced with guns. Empty buildings were requisitioned for the homeless, soldiers and their families were given pensions, access to the law was made free for all. The death penalty was even abolished, with a guillotine symbolically burned to show no rich people would lose their heads in this revolution. Even the way the commune self-organized was next-level progressive, at least at first. Rather than have a leadership structure, the commune separated into nine self-organizing commissions where every topic could be discussed and debated until consensus was reached. Even today, a lot of this sounds like a left-wing wish list, and this was all happening in 1871. I mean, seriously, at this stage, most of Europe was still ruled by kings. But we wouldn't want to give the impression that the commune was just all equality and progress. They might have abolished the death penalty, but the Neo-Jacobians were still there, still dying to put on a powdered wig and cosplay their Robespierre fantasies. As early as April the 5th, these guys managed to get the law on hostages passed, a fancy way of saying they can arbitrarily arrest anyone they thought to be anti-commune. Well over 200 people were jailed without committing a crime, including, famously, the Archbishop of Paris. Businesses deemed unfriendly were extorted. They also got the others to agree to restore the Republican calendar. This was the one the original Jacobians had instituted in 1793. From now on, this would no longer be 1871, but year 79. Yet perhaps the most pressing problem the commune faced wasn't the Neo-Jacobians trying to drag it into ultra-left-wing authoritarianism, but political reality. The reality that Thiers' Versailles government had managed to recover its footing and was now super interested in showing these communard punks who was the boss. On April the 1st, a group of guardsmen patrolling outside the walls of Paris ran into a regular army unit. In the skirmish that followed, five guardsmen were captured, four of them were summarily executed by gunshot. It was the first inkling those in Paris had of Adolphe Thiers' new tactics. The elected government in Versailles wasn't planning to negotiate, it wasn't going to go easy. This was now a fight for survival, and there could only ever be one winner. The tragedy of the Paris Commune comes in two flavors, each distinct, but each tasting of the bitterest disappointment. The first is just how comically inept they were at war. Thanks to their anarchist leanings, many in the National Guard considered voluntary participation and consensus forming among units to be a badge of honor. While that's all great in peacetime, it's less great when Adolphe Thiers is amassing a giant army to come and super kill you. The Commune itself reorganized this, trying to put military figures in charge of the National Guard. But guardsmen themselves are all like, go secure that fort, the one with those armed guys shooting at me from it? No thanks, I'd just rather sit here and get drunk. Thank you. But maybe next time. Every time the commune's experienced soldiers tried to institute proper military discipline, a whole bunch of guardsmen vanished, never to return. When they actually did go fight, they might desert the minute the regular army turned up. Especially now that the regular army was under the command of a bona fide hard ass, Patrice de McMahon. A future president of France, McMahon was like the answer to why voluntary collective action doesn't work made flesh. Before the commune had even been in power a month, it encircled Paris in a new siege, one as psychologically terrifying as anything the Prussians had done. It's this terror of artillery shells raining down that might explain the commune's second flavor of disappointment, how quickly the Neo-Jacobians took control. For these Robespierre fanboys, the commune's military failures were like, uh duh, we told you we needed a strong centralized dictatorship, didn't 
didn't you listen? Even as the anarchists and republicans resisted, they set up a secret police force under a 20-something named Raoul Rigaud to monitor the population. By April the 28th, as the situation got worse, they even pushed through the creation of a five-man dictatorship to run the show. It was named the Committee of Public Safety, after the old Robespierre outfit that had executed so many Parisians in the Reign of Terror. And just like that, the commune became something few of its founders had ever wanted. Still, we do need to be careful about overdoing the comparisons to Robespierre. The original Committee of Public Safety was responsible for tens of thousands of executions in Paris alone. Even with their backs against the wall, the commune's version would never authorize more than a few dozen. Yet there's no doubt this change in direction helped hasten the end. When the Committee of Public Safety declared itself all-powerful, the anarchists quit the commune's council in disgust. In the National Guard, the subsequent fight over who guardsmen were meant to answer to caused morale to collapse. In short, it was that classic staple of left-wing politics, facing a common threat not by working together, but by descending into ideological warfare. Dumb things apparently never change. By mid-May, it was clear the commune was going off the rails. Inside the city, communards had started destroying Napoleonic and monarchist symbols, determined that even if they were going down, they'd take as much of the hated past with them as they could. Not that it was actually clear that the commune was about to fail. Outside the city, Marshal McMahon was privately preparing for a long, bitter fight to retake Paris. So imagine his surprise when on May the 21st, a government sympathizer inside the city breathlessly reported that one of the western gates had been left undefended. Unable to believe his luck, McMahon sent some men to check and then nearly fell over when they reported back that, yeah, the city was really just wide open. In no time at all, McMahon was funneling tens of thousands of soldiers into Paris, soldiers with orders to shoot to kill and then shoot some more until nothing was left of this wretched commune. It was the beginning of the end, an end so bitter, so bloody, it would nearly destroy Paris. In the end, it took McMahon a week to retake the city. Known as the Bloody Week for reasons that are about to become extremely clear, it was a time of intense fighting, summary executions, and great cultural destruction. It was also the moment the commune ceased to function in any meaningful way. Although its end date is technically May the 28th, the commune more or less disintegrated in the face of the army. Guardsmen raced back to their old neighborhoods to make their last stand, preferring to protect their loved ones rather than join an organized resistance. This only made it easier for McMahon's well-trained army to pick them off neighborhood by neighborhood. The first major defeat came on May the 23rd, when government troops captured the area where the riot over cannons had sparked the commune's creation two months earlier. Pointedly, the army marched 40 captured communards to the exact spot Claude Lecomte had been lynched and mass executed them. This bit of brutality nicely set the stage for the following days. When 300 communards surrendered in a church, they were lined up and sprayed with machine guns. When one field hospital was taken, the commander in charge ordered the wounded National Guardsmen shot in their beds as the government slaughtered its way across Paris. Secret police chief Raoul Rigaud ordered the commune's own hostages killed. Fifty people, including the Archbishop of Paris, were executed in the commune's final days. But even that has nothing on the cultural destruction. On the evening of May the 23rd, the communards soaked the Tuileries Palace in gasoline, filled it with gunpowder, and blew it sky high. It was the beginning of a campaign of annihilation. Neo-Jacobian leader Louis-Charles de la Chuse ordered the burning of all of Paris's churches, police buildings, theatres, and fancy homes. The Palace of Justice went up, as did the Hotel de Ville. Some even attempted to set fire to Notre Dame, although the flames were quickly extinguished. By May the 25th, half of Paris was ablaze and the rest was devastated by street-to-street -street fighting. Yet, the end was already in sight. By now, most of the commune's leadership had fled the city. Those that stayed, such as de la Chuse and Rigaud, had died in the fighting. On May the 27th, the final bitter battle in the Pierre Lachey Cemetery ended with 150 communards captured and mass executed. The next day, with the commune defeated, the reprisals began. Today, it's unknown exactly how many people were killed in the bloody week in its aftermath. Mainstream estimates place the number of dead communards during the fighting at around 7,000, with up to another 15,000 executed by the army. Tens of thousands more were sent into exile. Against this staggering death toll, the 50 hostages shot by Rigaud's goons looks almost like small change. Although the Paris Commune died a violent death after only two months of existence, its effects were felt for decades. It was years before the City of Lights could be rebuilt from the communard fires, and that was just the physical effects. As soon as the Commune was gone, the fight began over its legacy, a fight that's still being fought today. On the one hand, the Commune's egalitarianism and working-class focus has inspired a whole bunch of people, from Vladimir Lenin to France's modern Yellow Vest protesters. 
You can even see its influence in the USA. What was the CHOP Autonomous Zone established in Seattle during the George Floyd protests, if not an American echo of 1871? On the other hand, the Commune's willful destruction of Paris has convinced many that it had a dark and violent core, one that could have easily veered into dictatorship had it lasted much longer. It's unlikely this fight is going to be settled anytime soon. Today, the Paris Commune occupies a strange place in French history, a warning for some, an inspiration for others. But there's no denying that it remains a fascinating tale, a moment when Parisians tried to claim their city for themselves and paid the ultimate price for doing so. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to check out our fantastic sponsor Squarespace, linking to them below, and thank you for watching.